One area you seem to feel uh, is underpriced somewhat is uh, financial institutions. Explain that, and uh, especially in the face that they're now in many ways utilities. Yeah. Politician sees them now as piggy banks to be picked uh, almost every week, it seems. And uh, I'd love to get your fix on uh, how you see technology, uh, okay. alternative payment systems are going to do to a traditional banks like Alipay. Okay. Well, those are two, two questions. I'll, yep. I'll address them separately. For, for, so for first, the bargains on financials. <coughs> financials, it's very interesting. They, they are being treated as piggy banks. And I think in the United States, uh, from the financial crisis through next year, roughly $300 billion in fines and regulatory damages will have been extracted from the major financial institutions. It's interesting to think about that number because if you leverage it, which is what bank capital uh, is, it's something to be leveraged to feed the economy, we see a huge amount of, of, of uh, economic activity that is being so extracted be, from... be over two trillion. Yeah. Well, if you, if you do it at, at ten times, uh, three. you know, it's three. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, a meaningful, that's a meaningful number. So you're right, huge, huge, huge amount of value coming out of, out of that. And I think the regulatory assault on, on, on financial institutions is in part responsible for investors depressed view of these businesses, uh, which is creating a, a valuation opportunity. And I think also, to some degree, it's a, a sense of investors are fighting the last war. So the financial institutions were clearly, they went into the, to the financial crisis very weak. They were bad actors. Their equity capital was, in many respects, destroyed uh, either entirely or partly. And investors don't, don't want to go back to the future, so to speak. But that ignores the new reality that we have in this industry, and that is massively recapitalized financial institutions, equity bases that are multiples today of what they were in, uh, in 2006, 2007, higher quality funding mixes. So they're completely different businesses uh, and much safer, in, in my view, and, and the valuations are attractive. Talking about uh, Euro banks, European banks, you say they're deleveraged. They're, you feel, are much better shape than they were three, five years ago. I would say that the U.S. banks are in far greater shape than they were, and are in far better shape than eurozone banks in general. Which isn't to say there aren't some opportunities in Europe in the banking industry. We own two banks in the United Kingdom, and we own a Dutch financial institution called ING. I would say, in general, the European banks are actually not in good shape. Which accounts for why they're not lending. Yes, they 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 still need to significantly replenish the quantity as well as the quality of their capital base. And U.S. banks' uh, lending activity doesn't seem to be that buoyant, at least judging from industrial and commercial loans. Yes, I, I think part of that is demand, and I think also part of that is supply. Uh, we just talked about three hundred billion being extracted from the banking industry. We've also, we're, we're in a period where capital ratios and capital, un capital uncertainty around capital ratios persists. Right. So if you're running a bank and you have regulators uh, every quarter extracting a pound of flesh out of your equity and other regulators telling you your equity is not enough next quarter compared to what I said it was going to be last quarter, y what are you going to do? You're going to husband your resources and you're going to err on the side of having a conservative capital base, which means not providing capital to, to the economy. Uh, you mentioned three financial institutions or two. There's a third, Royal Bank of Scotland, yeah. Lloyd's, and ING. Yeah. You still bullish on those three? Yeah. Our, our, our largest position out of the three there is Royal Bank of Scotland, and that would be the one that we, we like the most. We think it's the most undervalued of the three. Uh, for the same reasons you said before, they've gotten their act together, and uh, but people still think it's 2008. Well, <laughs> in many respects, yes. I mean, Royal Bank of Scotland is is probably the poster <coughs> child for for bad behavior leading up to the to the financial crisis. They 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 did everything wrong that a financial institution could almost everything wrong that a financial institution could be accused of doing wrong, uh, and so they've been on a multi-year journey of, of healing uh, the damage that they did to that institution. I mean, they have, they have delevered from uh, 2.6 2 .6 trillion you know, balance sheet. They've brought that down by you know, over, over a trillion 
plus dollars uh, since the financial crisis. They have purged themselves of, this would be a pound sterling number, 750 billion pounds of toxic assets. So the deleveraging has just been tremendous uh, in scope. But what we have now is a bank that's probably 75, 80% through that process and is now coming back to what has always been the core of that business and that is a very attractive retail and commercial bank in the United Kingdom, which is a very attractive banking market. It's a highly consolidated banking market and consolidation in banking means structural profitability. And so you now have a bank that's got a very strong capital base, it's got a strong market position, costs are coming out, the toxic assets are gone, and you can buy it at less than tangible Is it a downer that the government still owns the bulk of it? It's a, weighing over the market? It's, a, uh, it's an upper if you're a buyer. Okay. Uh, because I think that the presence of, of the UK government on the share register depresses the valuation. Uh, and when they, they will <clears throat> ultimately exit, uh, and you know, that, will, that will provide relief.